Chapter 17 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton. Chapter 17. After minutes or hours, a hand was laid on his shoulder and shook it. He raised his eyes stupidly, saw his guards already on their feet, and with them a third man, sent, doubtless, with orders to summon them. He rose, knowing that a decision had been made, one way or another, but still oddly numb and unmoved. The two men with him thrust away into the crowded little room, elbowing their fellows aside, till they had pushed and dragged their charge to the neighborhood of the fireplace and set him face to face with his judge. As they fell back a pace or two, as far as the crowding of the room allowed, someone again lit a branch at the fire and held it up that the light might fall upon the prisoner. To Theodore, the action brought with it a conviction that his sentence was death and his manner of receiving it a diversion for the eyes of the beholders. The old man was waiting, intent, with his chin on his hand, that he might lengthen the diversion by lengthening the suspense of the prisoner. When he spoke at last, his words were a surprise. Instead of a judgment came a query. What were you? He asked suddenly. And at the unexpected, irrelevant question, Theodore, still numb, hesitated, then repeated mechanically, what was I? In the days before the ruin, what were you? What sort of work did you do? How did you earn your living? He knew that, pointless as the question seemed, there was something that mattered behind it. His face was being searched for the truth, and the ring of listeners had ceased to jostle and were waiting in silence for the answer. I, I was a clerk, he stammered, bewildered. A clerk, the other repeated, as it seemed to Theodore suspiciously. There were a great many different kinds of clerks. They did all sorts of things. What did you do? I was a civil servant, Theodore explained, a clerk in the distribution office in Whitehall. That means you wrote letters. Did it count? Yes, wrote letters principally and filed them and drew up reports. The question sent him back through the ages. In the eye of his mind, he saw his daily office, the shelves, the rows of files, interminable files, and himself neat-suited, clean-fingered at his desk, neat-suited, clean-fingered, and idling through a short day's work, with Cassidy's head at the desk by the window, and Vernbaum, the Jew boy, who always wore a buttonhole. He brought himself back with an effort, from then to now, from the seemly remembrance of the life bureaucratic to a crowd of evil-smelling savages. You were always that, just a clerk? You never had any other way of earning a living? And again, he knew that the answer mattered, that his no was listened for intently. You weren't ever an engineer, the old man persisted, or a scientific man of any kind? No, Theodore repeated. I've never had anything to do with either engineering or science. When I left the university, I went straight into the distribution office, and I stayed there till the war. University. The word, so it seemed to him, was snatched at. You're a college man. I was at Oxford, Theodore told him. A college man. Then they must have taught you science. They always taught it at colleges chemistry and that sort of thing. You know chemistry? In the crowd was a sudden thrill that was almost murmur, and Theodore hesitated before he answered, his tongue grown dry in his mouth. Were these people, these outcasts from civilization, hoping to find in him a guide and savior who should lighten the burden of their barbarism by leading them back to the science which had once been a part of their daily life? but of which they had no practical knowledge? If so, how far was it safe to lie to them? And how far having lied 
Could he disguise his dire ignorance of processes mechanical and chemical? What would they hope from him, expect in the way of achievement and proof? Miracles, perhaps, sheer blank impossibilities. Science, they taught it to you, the old man was reiterating, insisting. Yes, they taught it to me, he stammered, delaying his answer. That is to say, I used to attend lectures. Then you know chemistry, gases and how to make them, and machines, do you know about machines? You could help us with machines, tell us how to make one. The dirty old face peered up at him, waiting for his yes, and he knew the other faces that he could not see were peering from the shadow with the same odd, sinister eagerness, all waiting, expectant. The temptation to lie was overwhelming, and what held him back was no scruple of conscience, but the brute impossibility of making good his claim to a knowledge he did not possess. The utter ignorance betrayed by the form of the old man's speech, you know chemistry, do you know about machines, would make no allowance for the difficulty of applying knowledge and see no difference between theory and instant practice. In his hopelessness, he gave them the truth, and the truth only. I have told you already, I'm not an engineer. I have never had any training in mechanics. As for chemistry, I had to attend lectures at school and college, but that was all. I never really studied it, and I'm afraid I remember very little, almost nothing that would be of any practical use to you. I don't know what you want, but whatever it is, it would need some sort of apparatus. A chemist has to have his tools like other men. Even if I were a trained chemist, I should need those. Even if I were a trained chemist, I couldn't separate gases with my bare hands. For that sort of thing, you need a laboratory, a workshop, the proper appliances. I'll work for you in any way that's possible, any way. But you mustn't expect impossibilities, chemistry and mechanics from a man who hasn't been trained in them. And why should you expect me to do what you can't do yourselves? Why should you? Is it fair? There was no immediate answer, but suddenly he knew that the silence around him had ceased to be threatening and tense. The old man's eyes had left his own. They were moving around the room and searching, as it seemed, for assent. In the end, they came back to Theodore, and judgment was given. If you are what you say you are, we will take you. But if you have lied to us, and you know what is forbidden, we shall find you out sooner or later, and as sure as you stand there, we will kill you. If you are what you say you are, a plain man like us, without devil's knowledge, you may come to us and bring your woman, if she is also without devil's knowledge. That is, if you can feed her, we have only enough for ourselves. And from this day forward, you will be our man, and tomorrow you will take the oath to be what we are and live as we do and be our man against all our enemies and perils. Are you agreed to that? He was saved and Ada with him. So much he knew, but as yet it was not clear what had saved him. He was to be their man, take an oath and be one with them. And there was the phrase devil's knowledge twice repeated. He stared stupidly at the man who had granted his life, realizing that his ordeal was over only when the packed room emptied itself and the old man turned back to his fire. End of chapter 17, recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Chapter 18 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton, Chapter 18. It was the phrase devil's knowledge that, when his first bewilderment was over, gave Theodore the clue to the meaning of the scene he had lived through and the outlook of those whose man he would become on the morrow. That, in the sudden memory of Markham, on the crest of the centuries, on the night when the crest curled over. He was so far taken into tribal fellowship 
that he had ceased to be openly a prisoner, but the two men who, for the rest of the night, shared with him the shelter of a lean-to hut, took care to bestow themselves between their guest and the entrance. He got little out of them in the way of enlightenment, for they were asleep almost as they flung themselves down on their moss. But for hours, while they snored, Theodore lay open-eyed, piecing together his fragmentary information of the world into which he had strayed. Without devil's knowledge, that, if he understood aright, was the qualification for admission to the life that had survived disaster. Devil's knowledge being, if he was not mad, the scientific, mechanical, engineering lore which was the everyday acquirement of thousands on thousands of ordinary civilized men. The everyday acquirements of ordinary men were anathema. If he was not mad, his own life had been granted him for the reason only that he was unskilled and devoid of them. Ignorant, even as the men who spared him, of practical science and mechanics, a plain man like unto them. Ignorance was prized here, esteemed as a virtue. The old man's query, you're a college man, had been an accusation disguised. In a flash, it was clear to him, and he saw through the farce whereby he had been tested and tempted, understood the motive that had prompted its cruel, low cunning, and all that the cunning implied of acceptance, of barbarism, insistence on it. What these outcasts, these remnants of humanity, feared above all things was a revival of the science, the mechanical powers that had wrecked their cities, their houses, and their lives, and made them what they were. In knowledge was death, and in ignorance alone was a measure of peace and security. Hence, fearing lest he was of those who knew too much, they had tempted him to confess to forbidden knowledge, to boast of it, that, having boasted, they might kill him without mercy, make an end of his wits with his life. In the torments inflicted by science destructive, they had turned upon science and renounced it, and that their terrors might not be renewed in the future, they were setting up against it an impassable barrier of ignorance. They had put devil's knowledge behind them with intention forever. If when they questioned him and led him on, he had yielded to the natural impulse to lie, they would have knocked him on the head like vermin without scruple, and the sweat broke out on him as he remembered how nearly he had lied. He sat up, sweating and staring at darkness, and thrust back the hair from his forehead. He was back among men who, of set purpose and deliberately, had turned their faces from the knowledge their fathers had acquired by the patience and toil of generations, who, of set purpose and deliberately, sought to filch from their children the heritage of the ages, the treasure of the mind of man. That was what it meant, the treasure of the mind of man, renunciation of all that long generations had striven for with patience and learning and devotion, the impossibility and the treason of it, to know nothing, to forget all their fathers had won for them. He remembered old talk of education as a birthright and the agitations of reformers and political parties. To this end, who were they, he asked himself, these people who had made a decision so terrible? What manner of men in the old life? Now they were seeking to live as the beasts live, and not only the world material had died to them, but the world of human aspiration. To this they had come, these people who once were human, the beast in them had conquered the brain, and like fire there blazed into his brain the commandment, Thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, thou shalt not eat lest ye die. The command, the prohibition, had suddenly a new significance. Was this, then, the purport of legend hitherto meaningless? Was this the truth behind the childish symbol, the deadly truth that knowledge is power of destruction? power of destruction too great for the human, the fallible, to wield. Odd that he had never thought of it before, that familiar all his life with a deadly truth, he had read it as primitive childishness. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat, lest ye die. He sat numbly repeating the words, half aloud, till there flashed into his brain a memory, a vision of Markham, in his room off Great Smith Street, on the night when war was declared, talking rapidly with his mouth full of biscuit. Only one thing I'm fairly certain about. I ought to have been strangled at birth. If the human animal must bite, it should kill off its scientific men, stamp out the race of them. What was that but a paraphrase, 
a modern application of the command laid upon Adam, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, lest ye die. To this first impulse of amazement and shrinking, as from treason, succeeded understanding of the outlook of these men and their decision. More, he wondered why, even in the worst of his despair, he had always believed in the persistence, the rebirth of the civilization that had bred him. These people, he saw it, were logical, as Markham had been logical, were wise after the event, as Markham had been wise before it. And it amazed him that in his pourings and guessings at a world reviving, he had never hit upon their simple solution of the eternal problem of war, Markham's solution, which, till this moment, he had not taken literally. You can't combine the practice of science and the art of war. In the end, it's one or the other. We, I think, are going to prove that very definitely, one or the other, the fighting instinct or knowledge. Man, because he fights, must deny himself knowledge, which is power over the forces of nature. The secrets of nature must be veiled from him by his own ignorance, lest when the impulse to strife wells up in him, they serve him for infinite destruction. These renegades, in agony, had made confession of their sin, of the corporate sin of a world, had faced the brutality of their own nature, had denied themselves the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and led themselves out of temptation. Since fight they must, being men with men's passions, they would limit their powers of destruction. So he read their strange, self-denying ordinance. The thought led him on to wonder whether they were alone in their self-denying ordinance. Surely not unless they lived hidden, in complete isolation, out of contact with others of their kind. And obviously they did not live isolated. They had spoken of others who were stronger, and of land that was theirs, implying a system of boundary and penalty for trespass and theft. Further, the phrase against all enemies indicated at least a possibility of the contact that was bloodshed, yet enemies who had not yet renounced the advantage of mechanical and scientific knowledge would be enemies who could overwhelm at the first encounter a community fighting as barbarians. What then was their relation to a world more civilized and communities that had not renounced? In the end, from sheer exhaustion, he ceased to surmise and argue with himself and slept suddenly and heavily, huddling for warmth on his moss bed against the body of his nearest jailer. It was a thrust from a foot that awakened him and he crawled out, shivering into the half-light of dawn and the chill of a frostbitten morning. The camp was alive and emerging from its shelters, the women already occupied in cooking the morning meal. Theodore and his guardian shared a bowl of steaming mess, a mingling of potatoes, dried green stuff, and gobbets of meat which he guessed to be rat flesh. They shared it wolfishly, each man eating fast lest his fellows had more than their portion. The meal over, the bowl was flung back to the women for washing, and his jailers, his mates now, relaxed. There was no further reason for unfriendliness, and they were willing enough to be communicative, with the slow uncommunicativeness of men who have little but their daily round to talk about. They had neighbors, yes, at least what you might call neighbors. There was a settlement much the same size as their own, some three or four hours journey away on the other side of the river that was the nearest, and the tribesmen met sometimes, but not often. Being questioned, they explained that there was frequent trouble about fishing rights, where our stretch of river ended and theirs began, trouble, and now and then, fighting. Yes, of course they lived as we do. How else should they live? They were better off for shelter, having taken possession of a village, but we, in the hills, were much safer, not so easy to attack or surprise. No, they were not the only ones. On this side of the river, but farther away, was another settlement, a larger one. There had been trouble with them, too, as they were very short of food and sent out raiding parties. They had fallen on the village across the water, carried off some of its winter stock, and set light to three or four houses. Later, a month ago, they had fallen on us, less successfully because we were warned and on the lookout for them. That was why we always have watchers at night, the watchers who saw your fire. Even from a first halting conversation with men who found anything but sheer statement of fact a difficulty, Theodore was able to construct in outline the common life of this new humanity, its politics, internal and external, the constitution of the tribe, the origin and keystone of the social system, had been, in the beginning, 
as much a matter of reckless chance as the mating of himself and Ada, small wandering groups of men who had come alive through the agony of war and famine, had been knit together by a common need or a terror of loneliness and insensibly welded into a whole and embryo community. It was a matter of chance too in the beginning whether the meeting with another little wandering group would result in bloodshed for the possession of food, sometimes for the possession of women, or a welcome and the joining up of forces. But to the joining up process, there was always a limit, the limit of resources available. A tribe which desired to augment its strength as against its rivals was faced with the difficulty of filling many hungry mouths. Their own community had once been faced with such a difficulty and had solved it by driving out three or four of its weaker members. What became of them, asked Theodore, and was told no one knew. It was winter when food ran short and they were driven out, and some of them had come back after nightfall to the edge of the camp and cried to be allowed in again, till the men ran out and drove them off with sticks and stone throwing. After that, they went and were no more seen. Later in the summer, there had broken out a sickness which again reduced their numbers. When the wind blew for long up the valley, it brought a bad smell with it and flies. That was what caused the sickness. There had been a great deal of it. It was said that in a village lower down the river, more than half the inhabitants had died. He surmised as he listened and realized later that it was the need of avoiding constant strife that had broken the nomadic habit and solidified the wandering and fluid groups into tribes with a settled dwelling place. Until a limit was set to their wanderings, Groups and single nomads drifted hither and thither in the search for food, snarling at each other when they met. The end of sheer anarchy came with appropriation by a particular group of a stretch of country which gave some promise of supporting it. That entailed the institution of communal property, the setting up of a barrier against the incursions of others, a barrier which was also a limit beyond which the group must not trespass on the land and possessions of others. Swiftly, insensibly, and naturally, there was growing up a system of boundaries, boundaries established in the first place by chance, by force or rough custom, and defined later by meetings between headmen of villages. Within its boundaries, each tribe or group existed as best it might, overstepping its limits at its peril, but disputing at intervals, as men have disputed since the world began, the precise terms of the agreement that defined its limits. And, agreements being verbal only, there were many occasions for dispute. As he questioned his new-made comrades and heard their answers, there died in Theodore's heart the hope that these people into whose midst he had stumbled, these people living like the beasts of the field, were but dwellers on the outskirts of a world reviving and civilized. Of men existing in any other fashion than their own, he heard no mention, no rumor. There was talk only of a camp here and a village there, where men fished and hunted and scratched the ground that they might find the remains of others sowing. The formal intercourse between the various groups was suspicious and slyly diplomatic, an affair of the meetings of headmen, though now and again, as life grew more certain, there was trading in the form of barter. One community had settled in a stretch of potato fields left derelict, which, even under rough and unskilled cultivation, yielded more than sufficient for its needs. Another, by some miracle, had possessed itself of goats. Three or four in the first instance, found wild among the hills, escaped from the hungry indiscriminate slaughter which had bared the countryside of cattle. These they bred, were envied for, guarded with arms in their hands and occasionally bartered, not without bitter resentment and dispute at the price their advantage exacted. But of those who possessed more than goats or the leavings of other men's fields, who lived as men had been wont to live in the days when the world was civilized, not a trace, not so much as a word. Direct questioning brought only a shake of the head. Towns, yes, of course there were towns further on, but no one lived in them. You could not get a living out of pavements, bricks, and hard roads. Up the river the way he had come was a stretch of dead land where nothing grew and no one lived. He had seen it for himself and knew best what lay beyond it. Lower down the river were the other camps like their own, so many they knew of and others they had heard of further off. In the distance, on the other side of those hills, there had been a large town in the old days. Ruins of it, miles of streets and ruins, were lying on both banks of the river. They themselves had never entered it, 
only seen it from a distance, but those who lived nearer had said it was mostly in ruins and that bodies were thick in the streets. In the summer, they had heard it was forbidden to enter it because it was those who had gone there in search of plunder who first were smitten with the sickness which spread from their camp along the valley. It was the wind blowing over the town, so they said, which brought the bad smell and the flies. No, they did not know its name, had never heard it. It was when he turned from the present to the past that Theodore found himself against a barrier, the barrier unexpected of a plain unwillingness to talk of the world that had banished. When spoken of at all, it was spoken of carefully, with precaution and choosing of phrase, and no man gave easily many details of his life before the ruin. At first, the strange attitude puzzled him. He could make nothing of the odd, suspicious glances whereby questioning was met, the attempt to parry it, the cautious, non-committal replies. It was only by degrees that he grasped their significance and understood how complete was that renunciation of the past which these people had imposed upon themselves. Forgetfulness, so Theodore learned in time, was more than a precaution. It had been preached in the newborn world as a religion, accepted as an article of faith. The prophet who had expressed the common need and instinct in terms of religion had in due time made his appearance a wild-eyed, eloquent scarecrow of a man, aflame with belief in his sacred mission and with loathing for the sins of the world. Coming from no one knew where, he carried his gospel through a land left desolate, proclaiming his creed of salvation through ignorance and crying woe on the yet unrepentant sinners who should seek to preserve the deadly knowledge that had brought God's judgment on the world. The seed of his doctrine fell on fruitful soil, on brutalized minds and starved bodies. The shaggy, half-naked enthusiast was hailed as a lawgiver, saint, and savior, and the harvest of souls was abundant. On every side, the faith was embraced with fervor, the bitter experience of the convert confirming the prophet's inspiration. Tribe after tribe reconciled itself to a God who had turned in wrath from his creatures, offended by their upstart pretensions and encroachments on the power of deity. Tribe after tribe made confession of its sin, groveling at the feet of a jealous omnipotence and renouncing the works of the devil and the deadly pride of the intellect. And in tribe after tribe, there were hideous little massacres, blood offerings, sweet and acceptable sacrifice that should purify mankind from its guilt. Those who were known to have pried into the hidden secrets of omnipotence were cut off in their wickedness, lest they should corrupt others were dragged to the feet of the prophet and slaughtered, lest they should defile humanity anew through the pride of the intellect and the power of their devil-sent knowledge. Men known to be learned or suspected of learning, men possessed of no more than mechanical training and skill, there was a story of one whom certain in the tribe would have spared, a doctor of medicine who had comforted many in the past. But the prophet cried out that this uttermost sacrifice too was demanded of them till frenzied with piety, they turned on their healer and beat out the brains that had served them. And over the bodies had followed an orgy of repentance, of groaning and revivalistic prayer, the priest blessing the sacrifice with uplifted arms and calling down the vengeance of God Most High upon those who should be false to the vow they had sworn in the blood of sinners. He chanted the vow, they repeating it after him, taking oath to renounce the evil thing, to stamp it out wherever met with, in man, in woman, in child. The prophet, so Theodore learned, had continued his wanderings, preaching the gospel as he went, through village after village and settlement after settlement, till he passed beyond the confines of report. He had bidden his followers expect his return, but whether he came again or not, his doctrine was firmly established. He had left behind him the germs of a priesthood, a tradition and a law for his converts a law which included the penalty of death for those who should fail to keep the vow. Lest it should fade from their minds, there were days set apart for renewal of the vow, for public ceremonial repetition of the creed and doctrine of ignorance, and with the ruin and ever-present memory to the remnant of humanity, the tendency was to interpret the law with all strictness. There were devotees and fanatics who watched with a mingling of animal fear and religious hate for signs of relapse and backsliding. Denunciation was of all things dreaded. An outspoken regret for a world that had passed had more than once been pretext for denunciation.
To dwell in speech on the doings of that world might be interpreted, had been interpreted, as a hankering after the thing forbidden, a desire to revive the accursed. Hence the parrying of questions, the barrier of protective silence which the newcomer broke through with difficulty. It took more than a day for Theodore to understand his new world and its meaning, to grasp its social system and civil and religious polity. But at the end of one day, he knew roughly the conditions in which he was destined to live out the rest of his life. Not that, in the beginning, he admitted that so he must live. It was long, many years, before he resigned himself to the knowledge that his limits till death released him were the narrow limits of his tribe. For years he held secretly, but nonetheless fast, to the hope of a civilization that must one day reveal itself, advance and overwhelm his barbarians. For years he strained his eyes for the coming of its pioneers, its saviors. It was long, very long, before he gave up his hopes and faced the certainty that, if the world he had known continued to exist, it existed too feebly and too far away to stretch out to himself and his surroundings. There were times when the longing for it flared and burned in him, and he sought desperately for traces of the world he had known, running hither and thither in search of it. Under pretext of a hunting expedition, he would absent himself from the tribe and trespass, often at the imminent risk of death, on the territory of alien communities, returning after days no nearer to his goal and no wiser for his stealthy prowlings. The life of alien communities, the prospect revealed from strange hills, was to all intents and purposes the life and outlook of his tribe. He would question the occasional stranger from a distant village in the hope of at least a word, a rumor, a rumor that might give guidance for further and more hopeful search. But those who came from distant villages spoke only of villages more distant, of other hunting grounds, of other tribal feuds, of other long stretches of ruin. The world, so far as it came within his ken, was cut to one pattern, the pattern of a cowed and brutalized man who bent his face to the stubborn ground and forgot the cunning of his fathers. End of chapter 18. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Chapter 19 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton. Chapter 19. The actual and formal ceremony of his acceptance into the little community took place after night had fallen, deferred to that hour in part because with nightfall the day's labor ceased and the fishermen and snarers of birds had returned to their dwelling place, and in part because darkness lit only by the glow of torches and wood fires lent an added solemnity to the rite. Earlier in the day the new tribesmen had been summoned to a second interview with the headmen, the old man questioned him shrewdly enough as to his road, the nature of his winter food store, and the feasibility of transporting it, and it was settled finally that Theodore should depart with the morning accompanied by another from the tribe. The pair could row and tow up the river, a flat-bottomed boat which was one of the community's possessions, and as his own camp was only a few hours' tramp from navigable water, he and his companion should be able, with a day or two, to make three or four journeys from camp to Riverside and load the boat with as much as it would carry of his hoard. If the weather favored, if snow held off and storm, they might return within five or six days. His instructions received, he was dismissed and bidden, since he would need a hut for himself and his wife, to set about its building at once. A site was allotted him on the edge of the copse that was the center of the tribal life and he was granted the use of some of the tools that were common property, an ax, a mallet, and a spade. By the time the sun set, his dwelling had made some progress. Stakes had been driven in to serve as corner posts and logs laid from one to the other. With dusk by twos and threes, the men had drifted back to the village and the women were busied with the cooking of supper 
at fires that blazed in the open so long as the weather was dry, as well as at the mud-built ovens that sheltered a flame from the wind. When they kept their men waiting for the plates and bowls of food, there was impatient shouting and now and then a blow. Theodore, as he ate his supper, noted suddenly that though one or two of the women carried babies, the camp contained no child that was older than the crawling stage, no child that survived the disaster. The night was rainless, and when the meal was over, the men, for the most part, lay or crouched near their fires, some torpid, some talking with their women, but they roused and stood upright when the ceremony began, and the headman, calling for silence, beckoned with a dirty claw to Theodore. Here, said Theodore, and went to him. The old man was seated on the trunk of a fallen tree. He waited till the tribesmen, one and all, had ranged themselves on either hand and then signed to Theodore to kneel. Give me both your hands, he ordered, and held them between his own. As in days long past, so Theodore remembered. The overlord, the suzerain, had taken the hands of his vassal. Did he remember this latter-day barbarian, the ritual of chivalry, the feudal customs of Capet, Hohenstaufen, and Planchenet, or was his imitation of their lordly right unconscious? So that you may live and be one of us, the old man began, you will swear two things, to be true to your fellows and humble and meek towards God. Before God and before all of us, you will take your oath, and if you break it, May you die the death of the wicked, and may fire consume you to eternity. The words were intoned and not spoken for the first time. The ritual of the ceremony was established, and at definite points and intervals, the bystanders broke in with a mutter of approval or warning, already traditional. First, you will swear till death takes you to be our man against all perils and enemies. I will be your man till death takes me, swore Theodore, against all perils and enemies. You are witness, said the headman, looking round, and was answered by a murmur from the listeners. The women did not join in it. They had, it seemed, no right of vote or assent, but they had drawn near every one of them, and were peering at the ceremony from beyond the shoulders of their men. And now, came the order, you will take the oath to God, to purify your heart and renounce devil's knowledge for yourself and for those who come after you. Swear it after me, word by holy word, and swear it with your heart as with your lips. And word by word and line by line, Theodore repeated the formula that cut him off from the world of his youth and the heritage of all the ages. It was a rhythmical formula, its phrasing often biblical, Instinctively, the prophet, when he framed his new ritual, had followed the music of the old. Written pages and the stonework of churches might perish, but the word that was spoken endured. I do swear and take oath before God and before man that I will walk humbly all my days and put from me the pride of the intellect, remembering that the meek shall inherit the earth and that the poor in spirit are acceptable in the sight of the Most High. Therefore, I do swear and take oath that I will purify my heart of that which is forbidden, that I will renounce and drive out all memory of the learning which is not meant for me, who am sinful man, to know. What I know and remember of that which is forbidden shall be dead to me as if it had never been born. May my hands be struck off before I set them to the making of that which is forbidden, and may blindness smite me if I seek to pry into the hidden mysteries of God into the secrets of the earth, into the secrets of the air, the secrets of water or fire. For the Lord our God is a jealous God, and the secrets of earth, air, water, and fire are sacred to him who made them and must not be revealed to sinners. Therefore, I pray that my tongue may rot in my mouth before I speak one word that shall kindle the desire of others for that which must not be revealed. I call upon the Lord Most High, who made heaven and earth and all that in them is, to hear this oath that I have sworn. And in the day that I am false to it, I call on him to blast me with his utmost wrath. And I call upon my fellow men to hear this oath that I have sworn. May they shed my blood without mercy in the day that I am false to it by thought, word, or deed. <laughs> 
In the day that I am false to it, may they visit my sin on my head, as I will visit their sin on man, woman, or child, who in my sight or in my hearing shall hanker after that which is forbidden. For so only shall we cleanse and purify our hearts, so only shall we live without devil's knowledge and bring up our children without it, that the land may have peace in our days and that the wrath of the Most High may be averted from us. So help me God. Amen. Amen, came back in a chorus from the shadowy group on either hand, and when the echo of their voices had died in the night, the headman loosed Theodore's hands. He rose and looked round him on the faces that were near enough to see, searched them in the firelight for regret or a memory of the past, and beyond and behind the ring of stolid, expressionless faces and the desert silence, saw Markham toasting the centuries, heard the moving thunder of a multitude and the prayer of the Westminster bells. Lord, through this hour, the old man stretched out a hand in token of comradeship admitted, and Theodore took it mechanically. End of chapter 19, recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Chapter 20 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton, Chapter 20. With dawn, Theodore and a stolid companion, appointed by the headman, set out on their journey to the camp where Ada awaited them. They reached it only after weather-bound delays. As they towed their boat against a current that was almost too strong for their paddling, they were overtaken by a blinding snowstorm and escaped from it barely with their lives. They made fast their boat to the stump of a tree and groped through the smother to a shed near the river's edge. And there, for the better part of a day, they sheltered while the storm lasted. When it moderated and they pushed on through the dead village, a thick sheet of snow had obliterated the minor landmarks whereby Theodore had been wont to guide his way. It was close upon sunset on the third day of their journey when they trudged into the hidden valley and the familiar tree clump came into sight, and dusk was thickening into moonless dark when Ada, hearing voices, ran forward with a scream of welcome. She sobbed and laughed incoherently as she clung round her husband's neck, hysterical, perhaps near insanity, through loneliness and the terror of loneliness. In the intensity of her relief at the ending of her ordeal, she forgot at first to be greatly disappointed because the world of Theodore's discovery was a world without a cinema or a charabanc. With her craving for company, it was sheer delight to know that in a few days more, she would be in the midst of some two-score human beings, whatever their manner of living. It took time and explanation to make her understand that the desire for a charabanc in cinema must no longer be openly expressed. She stared uncomprehendingly when Theodore strove to make clear to her the religious as well as the practical idea that lay behind the prohibition. The need for caution was the more urgent since he had learned in the course of the return journey that his appointed companion was a fanatic in the new faith, a penitent who groaned to his offended deity, savagely pure-hearted in the cult of ignorance and savagely suspicious of the backslider. The religious temperament was something so far removed from Ada's experience that he found it impossible at a first hearing to convince her of the unknown danger of intolerant and distorted faith. His mention of a religious aspect to their new difficulties brought the vague rejoinder that her mother was a Baptist, but her aunt had been married in a Catholic church to an Irishman, and in the end he gave up his attempt at explanation and snapped out an order instead. You're to be careful how you talk to them. Until you get to know them, you'd better say nothing about what you used to do in the old times. Nothing at all, do you hear? She stared, uncomprehending, but realized the order was an order. What she did understand and tremble at was the lack of provision for her coming ordeal of childbirth, and there was a burst of loud weeping and terrified protest when Theodore admitted, in answer to her questions, 
that he had found no trace of either hospitals, nurses, or doctors. For the time being, he soothed her with a hurried promise of seeking them further afield, pushing on to find them. They were sure to be found when she was settled in comfort and safety with other women to look after her. For the time being, he told himself, the soothing deceit was a necessity. She would understand later, see for herself what was possible, settle down and accept the inevitable. She was all eagerness to start, but it took two full days before the requisite number of journeys had been made to the river. Their stores packed on an improvised sled, dragged heavily across the miles of frozen snow and stowed in the flat bottom boat. Then on the third day, Ada herself made the journey, helped along by the men who, when the ground was smooth enough, set her on the sled and dragged her. In spite of their help, she needed many halts for rest and the distance between camp and river took most of the hours of daylight to accomplish. Hence, they sheltered for the night in a cottage not far from the river's bank and with morning dropped downstream in the boat, paddling cautiously as they rounded each bend and always on their guard against the possibility of unfriendly meetings. The long desolation they passed through was a no man's land. Any stray hunter, therefore, might deem himself at liberty to attack when he saw and seize what he found in their possession. But throughout the short day was neither sight nor sound of man and by sunset the current, running swollen and rapidly, had brought them to their destined landing. After that came the mooring of the boat in the reeds and the hiding on the bank of the river of the stores they could not carry, then the long uphill tramp over snow in the gathering darkness, with Ada shivering, crying from weariness, and clinging to her husband's arm. And, at last, the glow of fires through tree trunks, with figures moving round them, shaggy men and unkempt women, their home. The unkempt women met their fellow not unkindly. They drew her to the fire and rubbed her frozen hands. Then, while one brought a bowl of steaming mess, another laid dry moss and heather in the bed place of her unfinished dwelling. A protesting baby was wakened from its sleep and dandled for her comfort and inspection, its mother giving frank and loud voice details concerning the manner of its birth. There was a rough and good-natured attempt to raise her drooping spirits, and Ada, fed and warmed, brightened visibly, and responded to the click of tongues. This, at least, the new world had restored to her, the blessing of loud voices raised in chatter. All the same, on the second night of their new life, Theodore, awake in the darkness, heard her sniffing and swallowing her tears. What is it? he asked, and she clung to him miserably and wept her forebodings on his shoulder not only forebodings of her coming ordeal in the absence of hospitals and doctors, but was this, in truth, to be the world? These people, so they told her, knew of no other existing, but what had become of all the towns, the trams, the shops, the life of the towns, her life? Where was it? It must be somewhere, a little way off. Where was it? He soothed her with difficulty, repeating his warnings on the danger of open regrets for the past and reminding her that tomorrow she also would be called on for the oath. I know, she whimpered. Of course I'll take an oath if I must, but you can't help thinking. If you swear yourself black in the face, you can't help thinking. Whatever you think, he insisted, you mustn't say it to anyone. I know, she snuffled obediently. I shan't say nothing. But, oh God, oh God, aren't we ever going to be happy again? He knew what she was weeping for, shaking with miserable sobs, the evenings at the pictures, the little bits of machine-made finery, the petty products of devil's knowledge that had made up her daily life. The cry to her God was a prayer for the return of these things, and the hope of them had so far sustained her in peril, hardship, and loneliness. Pictures and finery had always been there, just a mile or two beyond the horizon, awaiting her enjoyment so soon as it was safe to reach them. Now, in her overpowering misery and darkness of soul, she was facing the dread possibility that they no longer awaited her, that the horizon was immeasurable, infinite. Guns and bombs and poisons, nobody wanted them, and she understood people making up their minds to do without them. But the other things, you couldn't go on living without the other things, shops and proper houses and railways. It can't be for always, she persisted. It can't be. 
and was cheered by the sudden heat of his agreement, the sudden note of protest in his voice, the knowledge that he sympathized encouraged her, and with her head on his shoulder, sniffing but comforted, she began to plan out their deliverance. They must be somewhere, the people that live like they used to, keeping quiet, I'd say, till things get more settled. When things is settled, they'll get a move on and come along and find us. It stands to reason they can't be so very far off, because I remember the teacher telling us when we had our geography lesson that England's quite a small country, so they haven't got so very far to come. I expect an aeroplane will come first. He felt her thrill and expectation of the moment when she sighted the swiftly moving speck aloft, the bearer of deliverance drawing nigh. Wouldn't it be heavenly when they saw one at last, after all these awful months and years? In the war, they were beastly. But now that the war was over, what had become of all the passenger planes and the airships? She was always looking out for one, always. Every morning when she came out of the hut, the first thing she did was to look up at the sky. And someday, one was bound to come. When things had settled down and got straight, it was bound to. But it never did, and in the end, she ceased to look for it. His attempts, they were many in the first few years, to break away from his world and his bondage of ignorance, were made always with cunning precaution and subterfuge. Not even the pitiable need of his wife would have served as excuse for the backsliding which was search after the forbidden. To a fanaticism dominated by the masculine element, the pains of childbirth were once more an ordinance of God. And when, a few weeks before Ada's time of trial, Theodore absented himself from the camp for a night or two, he gave no one, save Ada, warning of his journey, and later accounted for his absence by a plausible story of straying and a hunter's misfortunes. He had ceased, since he took up his dwelling with the tribe, to believe in the neighborhood of a civilization and being. All he hoped for was the neighborhood, not too distant, of men who had not acquiesced in ruin and put hope of recovery behind them. What he sought primarily was that aid and comfort in childbirth, for which his wife appealed to him with insistence that grew daily more terrified. What he sought fundamentally was escape from a people vowed to ignorance. The goal of his first journey was the town lying lower down the river, the forbidden city which had once bred pestilence and flies. He approached it deviously, keeping to the hills and avoiding districts he knew to be inhabited, hoping against hope that in spite of report, he might find some rebuilding of a civic existence and human life as he had known it. What he found when he came down from the foothills and trudged through its outskirts was the customary silent desolation, a desolation flooded and smelling of foul water, untenanted streets that were channels and backwaters, and others where the slime of years lay thick and scum bred rank vegetation. Silent streets and empty houses had long been familiar to him, but until that day he had not known how swiftly nature, left to herself, could take hold of them. The river and the life that sprang from it was overwhelming what man had deserted. Three winters of neglect in a low-lying, well-watered country had wrought havoc with the work of the farmer and the engineer. Streams which had been channeled and guided for centuries had already burst their way back to freedom. With every flooded winter, more banks were undermined, more channels silted up and shifted, and that which had been plowland, copse, or water meadow was relapsing into bog undrained. The valley above and below the town was a green swamp studded with reedy little pools, a refuge for the water bird where a man would set foot at his peril. Buildings here and there stood rotting, forlorn, and inaccessible. Barns, sheds, and farmhouses their walls leaning drunkenly as foundations shifted in the mud. And in the town itself, as surely, if more slowly, the waters were taking possession. Towns had vanished, he knew, vanished so completely that their very sites had been matter of dispute to antiquarians, but never till today had he visualized the process, the rising of layer on layer of mud, the sapping of foundations by water, the forces that made ruin and the forces that buried it, Flood and frost and the persistent thrust of vegetation. As the waterlogged ground slid beneath them, rows of jerry-built houses were sagging and cracking to their fall. Here and there, one had crumbled and lay in a rubble heap, the water curdling at its base. How many lifetimes, he wondered, till the river had the best of it, 
and the houses where men had gone out and in were one and all of them a rubble heap, underwater and mud and rank greenery. He saw them decades or centuries ahead as a waste, a stretch of bogland where the river idled, bogland now flooded, now drying and cracked in the sun, and with broken green islets still thrusting through the swamp, broken green islets of moss-covered rock that underneath was brick and mortar. In time, it might be, with more decades or centuries, the islets also would sink lower in the swamp, disappear. The process, unhindered, was certain as sunrise. The important little streets that humanity had built for its vanished needs and its vanished business would be absorbed into an indifferent wilderness, in all things sufficient to itself. The rigid, important little streets had been no more than an episode in the ceaseless life of the wilderness, an episode ending in failure, to be decently buried and forgotten. He plodded aimlessly through street after street that was fordable till the shell of a county infirmary mocked at Ada's hopes and recalled the first purpose of his journey, a gaunt, sodden building, the name yet visible on walls that sweated fungi and mold. Then, that he might leave nothing undone in the way of help and search, he trudged and waded to the lower outskirts of the town, where the roads lost themselves in grass and flooded water, and there stretched to the limit of his eyesight a dull winter landscape without sign of living care or habitation. In the end, having strained his eyes after that which was not, he turned to slink back to his own place, skirting alien territory where the sight of a stranger might mean an alarm and a manhunt, and sheltering at night where his fire might be hidden from the watcher. You haven't found nothing, Ada whimpered when he had told his necessary lies to the curious and they were out of earshot in their hut. Her eyes had grown piteous when he stumbled in alone. She had dreamt in his absence of sudden and miraculous deliverance, following him in fancy through streets with tram lines, where dwelt women who wore corsets, also doctors, who, perhaps, when they knew the greatness of her need, would send a motor ambulance to fetch her to a bed with sheets on it. Nothing, he told her, almost roughly, afraid to show pity. No doctors, no houses fit to live in, Wherever I've been, and as far as I could see, it's like this. End of chapter 20. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Chapter 21 of Theodore Savage, The Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton, Chapter 21. It was in the third spring after the ruin of man that Ada's time was accomplished and she bore a son to her husband. On a day in late April or early May, there was going and coming round the shelter that was Theodore's home. The elder women of the tribe, by right of their experience, took possession and from early morning till long after nightfall, they busied themselves with the torment and mystery of birth. And with the aid of nothing but their rough and unskilled kindliness, Ada suffered and brought forth a squalling red mannequin, the heir of the ages and their outcast. The child lived and despite its mother's fecklessness was lusty as a boy, ran shoeless and in summer naked as Adam, and grew to his primitive manhood without letters, knowing of the world that was past and gone, only legends derived from his elders. His coming to Theodore meant more than paternity. The birth of his son made him one with the life of the tribe. By the child's wants and helplessness, still more when other children followed. His father was tied to an existence which offered the necessary measure of security to the stretch of land where he had the right to hunt unmolested, the patch he had the right to sow and reap, and the company of those who would aid him in protecting his children. He had given his hostages to fortune and the limits set to his secret expeditions in search of a lost world were the limits set by the needs of those dependent on him, by his fear of leaving them too long, unprotected, unprovided for. He learned much from his firstborn and the brothers and sisters who followed him, not only the intimate lore of his fatherhood, 
but the lore and outlook of man bred uncivilized, and the traditions in making of a world to come, which in all things would resemble the old traditions handed down by a world that had died. His children lived naturally, the life that had been forced upon their father and inherited ignorance as a birthright. Growing up, such as lived through the perils of childhood, without knowledge of the past and untempted by the sin of the intellect. The oath which Theodore, like every new-made father, was called on to swear in the name of the child he had given to the tribe, had a meaning to those who had lived through disaster and witnessed the ruin of man. To the next generation, the vow was a formula only, a renunciation of that they had never possessed. They could not, if they would, instruct their children in the secrets of God, the forbidden lore of the intellect. By the time his first son was of an age to think and question, Theodore understood more than the growth and workings of a child mind. Much that had hitherto seemed dark and fantastic in the origins of a world that had ended with the ruin of man. It was the workings of a child mind that made oddly clear to him the significance of primitive religious doctrine and beliefs handed down through the ages, the once meaningless doctrine of the fall of man and the belief in a vanished golden age. These, the boy, unprompted, evolved from his own knowledge and the talk of his elders, accepting them spontaneously and naturally. In Theodore's childhood, the golden age had been a myth and pleasant fancy of the ancients, and the fall of man as distant as the book of Genesis, and unreal as the tale of Puss in Boots. To his children, one and all, the legends of his infancy were close and undoubted realities, the golden age was a wondrous condition of yesterday. The fall, the ruin, its catastrophic overthrow, and experience their father had survived. The fields and hillsides where they worked, played, and wandered were still littered with strange relics of the golden age, the vanished, fruitful, incomprehensible world whence their parents had been cast into the outer darkness of everyday hardship as a penalty for the sin of mankind. The sin unforgivable of grasping at the knowledge which had made them like unto gods, a mad ambition which not only they but their children's children must atone for in the sweat of their brow. More than once Theodore suspected in the secret recesses of his youngsters' minds a natural and wondering contempt for the men of the last generation, the fools and blind who had overreached themselves and forfeited the splendor of the golden age by their blundering greed and unwisdom. So history was writing itself in their minds, making of a race that had acquiesced in science and drifted to destruction, a legendary people whose sin was deliberate, a people whose encroachments had angered a self-important deity and brought down his wrath upon their heads. It was a history inseparable from religious belief, its opening chapters identical in all essentials with the legendary history of an epoch that had ceased to exist. Once his eight-year boy, planted sturdily before him, demanded a plain explanation of the folly of his father's contemporaries. Why, he asked frowning, did the people want to find out God's secrets? Theodore thought of Ada and the countless millions like her, leaned his chin on his hand and smiled grimly. Some of us didn't, he answered. Some of us, many of us, had no interest in the secrets of God. We made use of them when others found them out, but we ourselves were quite content to be ignorant, ignorant in all things. I know the child assented, puzzled by his father's smile. The good ones didn't want to, the good ones like you and mommy, but the others, all the wicked ones, why did they? It was stupid of them. They wanted to find out, said Theodore, and there have always been people like that from the beginning, the very beginning of things, ever since there were men on the earth. The desire to know burned them like a fire. There is an old story of a woman who brought great trouble into the world because she wanted to know. She was given a box and told never to open it, but she disobeyed because she was filled with a great curiosity to know what had been put inside it. Her longing tormented her night and day, and she could think of nothing else, till at last she opened the box and horrible creatures flew out. The boy, interested, demanded more of Pandora and the horrible creatures. Is it a true story, he asked, when his father had given such further details as he managed to remember and invent? Yes, Theodore told him, I believe it is a true story. It was so long ago that we cannot tell exactly how it happened. 
I may not have told it to you quite rightly, but on the whole, it is a true story. And the wicked people, our wicked people who brought ruin on the world, were much like Pandora and her box. It was the same thing over again. They wanted to know so strongly that they forgot everything else. They had only the longing to find out, and it seemed as if nothing else mattered. Weren't they afraid? The boy asked doubtfully, still puzzled by his father's odd smile. Afraid of what would happen to them? No, Theodore answered, until it was too late and they saw what they had done. I don't think many were afraid. Here and there, before the end, some began to be frightened, but most of them didn't see where they were going. But they must have known, his son insisted, frowning. God told them he would punish them if they tried to learn his secrets. Yes, Theodore assented, with the orthodox truth, more deceptive than a lie, that meant one thing to him and another to the world barbarian. Yes, God told them so, but though he said it very plainly, not many of them understood. They were talking, he knew, across more than the gulf between the mind of a child and a man. Between them lay the centuries, the barrier of many generations. To his son, now and always, dead and gone chemists and mathematicians must appear in the likeness of present evildoers, raiders of the territory and robbers of the property of God. To his son, now and always, inventors and spectacled professors in mortarboards would be greedy, foolish chieftains who planned war against heaven as a tribe plans assault upon its rivals. These were and must always be his wicked, his destroyers of the golden age, his life and outlook being what it was. How should he picture the war against heaven as pure-hearted, instinctive, and unconscious? Why not, the child persisted, repeating the question when his father stroked his head absently. Because they did not know themselves. If they had known themselves and their own passions, they would have seen why knowledge was forbidden. Yes, said the child vaguely, and passed to the matter that interested him. Why didn't the others make them understand, you and the other good ones? Because, said Theodore, we ourselves didn't understand. That was the blunder, the sin of the rest of us. We didn't seek after knowledge, but we took the fruits of other men's knowledge and ate. Unconsciously, he made use of the familiar hereditary simile. I'd have killed them, his son declared firmly. Every one, I'd have told them to stop, and then if they wouldn't, I'd have killed them, thrown them in the river, or hammered them with stones till they died. That's what I'd have done. No, Theodore told him, you wouldn't have killed them. One of them said the same thing to me, one of the wicked ones. He said we should have stamped out the race of them. Afterwards, I knew he was right, but at the time I didn't understand. I couldn't. I heard what he said, but the words had no real meaning for me. He saw something that was almost contempt in his son's eyes and took the grubby face between his hands. That same wicked man, who was also very wise, told me something else that is as true for you as it was for me. He said that we never know anything except through our own experience. I might tell you that the sun is warm or the water is cold, but if you had never felt the heat of the sun or the cold of the water, you would not know what I meant. And it was like that with us, there were always some few who understood that knowledge was a flame that, in the end, would burn us. But the rest of us couldn't even try to save ourselves until after we were burned. He stroked the grubby face as he released it. That's the law, son, and all that matters you'll learn that way. That way and no other, just as we did. In time, he found himself recalling, with strange interest, the fairy tales of his childhood. He spent long hours reweaving and piecing them together, searching his memory for half-remembered fragments of what had once seemed fantasy or nonsense invented for the nursery. The hobgoblins and heroes of his nursery days were transformed and made suddenly possible. Looking through the mind of a new generation, he saw that they might have been as human and prosaic as himself. More, he came to know that he and his commonplace civilized contemporaries would be the heroes and hobgoblins of the future. The process, the odd transformation, would be simple as it was inevitable. It was forbidden by the spirit and letter of the vow to awaken youthful curiosity concerning the past, youthful curiosity whose end might be youthful experiment 
but women, in spite of all vows and prohibitions, would gossip to each other of their memories. While they talked, their children would listen, open-eyed and puzzled, and when a youngster demanded the meaning of an unfamiliar term or impossible happening, the explanation, as a matter of course, took the form of analogy, of comparison with the known and familiar. The aeroplane was a bird extinct and monstrous, larger, many times larger, than the flapping heron or the owl. The bomb was more dreadful than a lightning stroke. The tram, train, or motor a gigantic wheelbarrow that ran without man or beast to drag it. The ignorance of science of those who told, the yet greater ignorance of those who heard, resulted inevitably before many years had passed in myth and religious legend, an outwardly fantastic statement of actual fact and truth. The children, piecing together their fragments of incomprehensible information, made their own image of the past to be handed on later to their sons. An image of a world fantastic, enchanted and amazing, destroyed as a judgment for sin against God by strange fire-breathing beasts and bolts from heaven. A world of gigantic fauna and bewitched chariots, likewise of sorcerers, their masters, whom God and the righteous had exterminated. So, Theodore realized, as his children grew and he heard them talk, must a race that knew nothing of science explain the dead wonders of science. From the message that flashes round the world in seconds, to the petrol engine and the magic slumber of chloroform, that which is outside the power and beyond the understanding of man has always been denounced as magic. And steam, electricity, chemical action were outside the power and beyond the understanding of men born after the ruin. In default of understanding, they must needs fall back on a wizardry known to their fathers. Thus he and his contemporaries to their children's children would be semi-supernatural beings, fit comrades of Sinbad or Perseus or the Quatrefils Iman, giants with great voices that called to each other across continents and vasty deeps, possessors of seven-league boots, magic steeds, and flying carpets, of all the stock and trade of the fairy tale. Belief in the demigod was a natural growth and product of the world wherein his son grew to manhood. Given time and black ignorance of mechanics and science, and the engineer would be promoted to a giant or demigod, who by virtue of a strength that was more than human, dammed rivers, drained bogs, and pierced mountains. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, and always in the past there had been giants, titans, and Hercules, removing mighty obstacles and cleansing the stables of Angeus. He came to understand that all wonders were facts misinterpreted and that given time and ignorance, a post office underling tapping out his Morse code might be seen as a genie or an Oberon, the absolute master of obedient sprites who could lay their girdles round the earth. And he pictured a college-bred, sober-suited Hercules planning his labors in the office of a limited company jotting down figures, estimating costs, and scanning the reports of geologists. Figures and reports, like his tunnels and dams, would pass into the limbo of science, forgotten and forbidden. But the memory of his labors, his defiance of brute nature, would live on as the story of a demigod. And the childhood that was barbarism would explain his achievements by a giant strength that could tear down trees and move mountains. The idea took fast root and grew in him, the idea of a world that, time and again, had returned to the helplessness of childhood. He saw science as the burden that, time and again, the race found intolerable, as dead sea fruit that turned to ashes in the mouth, as riches that humanity strove for, attained and renounced, renounced because it dared not keep them. In his hours of dreaming, he made fairies and demigods out of dapper little sedentary persons, the senders of forgotten telegrams, with forgotten engines, motor cars, and aeroplanes, at their insignificant command. And once, in the night, when Ada snored beside him, he asked himself if Lucifer, son of the morning, Lucifer who strove with his god and was worsted, were more in his beginnings than a scientist intent on his work. A chemist, a spectacled professor, resplendent only in degrees and learning, an archfiend of knowledge who had sinned against God in the secret places of a laboratory and not upon the shining plains of heaven. 
and whom ignorance and time had glorified into the tempter, the evil one, setting him magnificently in the flaming hell which he and his like, by their skill and patience, had created and let loose upon man. This, at least, was certain, that in years to come and under other names, his children's children would retell the story of Lucifer, son of the morning, the enemy of man who was flung out of heaven because, in his overweening vanity, he encroached on the power of a god. It was the new world that taught him that man invents nothing, is incapable of pure invention, that would seem his wildest, most fantastic imaginings are no more than ineffective, distorted attempts to set down a half-forgotten experience. What had once appeared prophecies he saw to be memories, the day of judgment, when the heavens should flame and men call upon the rocks to cover them, belonged to the past before it belonged to the future. The forecast of its terrors was possible only to a people that had known them as realities, a people troubled by a dim race memory of the conquest of the air and catastrophe hurled from the skies. So, at least, his children taught him to believe. End of chapter 21. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Chapter 22 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton. Chapter 22. With years and rough husbandry, the resources of the tribe were augmented, and it emerged from its first starved misery. More land was brought under cultivation, and, as tillage improved and better crops were raised, the little community was less dependent on the haphazard luck of its fishing and snaring, and lived further from the line of utter want. While, save in bad seasons, the intertribal raiding that was caused by sheer starvation was less frequent. Even so, Strife was frequent enough, small intermittent feud that flared now and again into savagery, the desire of a growing community to extend its hunting grounds at the expense of a neighbor meant, almost inevitably, appeal to the right of the strongest. Other quarrels had their origin in the border inroads and reprisals of poachers or a barbaric setting of the eternal story that was old when Helen launched a thousand ships. With husbandry, even rough husbandry, came the small beginnings of commerce, the barter and exchange of one man's superfluities for the produce of another man's fields. Cold and nakedness stimulated ingenuity in the matter of clothing, even in a society whose original members had in large part been bred to depend in all things on the aid of the machine and to earn a livelihood by the performance of one action only, the tending of one lathe, the accomplishment of one stereotyped mechanical process. Outcasts of civilization flung into the world of savagery, they had in the beginning none of the adaptability and none of the resources of the savage, knew nothing of the properties of unfamiliar plants, knew neither what to weave nor how to weave it, and often, from sheer lack of understanding, starved and shivered in the midst of plenty. It was not till they had suffered long and intolerably that they learned to clothe themselves from such material as their new world afforded to cure skins of animals and stitch them together into garments. In the first years of ruin, only rat skins were plentiful. But as time went on, rabbits, cats, and wild dogs multiplied and, spreading through the countryside, were trapped and hunted for their flesh and the warmth of their skins. The dogs, as they bred, reverted to a mongrel and wolf-like type, which, in summer, preyed largely on vermin. In winter, when scarcity of food made them bold, they prowled in packs, were a danger to the solitary and a legendary terror to children. In the beginning, the village was a straggle of rude huts, the tribesmen building how and where they would. Later, it took shape within its first wall and was roughly circular, enclosed by a fence of stake and thorn bush. The raising of the fence was a sign and result of the beginning of primitive competition in armament. It was the knowledge that one village had fortified itself that set others to the driving in of stakes. 
One November evening, Theodore, trudging in with his catch, saw a group round the headsman's fire. The center of interest, a youth who had returned from poaching on other men's land and brought back news of their doings. His trespassing had taken him within sight of the neighboring village, which lately was a cluster of huts, like their own, and now was surrounded by a wall, a stockade fully the height of a man, with only one gap for a gate. The poacher's news was discussed with uneasy interest. The fortified tribe, in point of numbers, was already stronger than its rival. If it added this new advantage to its numbers, what was there to prevent it from raiding and robbing as it would? Having raided and robbed, it could shelter behind its defenses, beat off attack, make sorties and master the countryside. Its security meant the insecurity of others, the dependence of others on its goodwill and neighborly honesty. The issue was as plain to the handful of tribesmen as to old-time nations competing in battleships, aeroplanes, and guns, and the suspicions muttered round the headsman's fire were the raw material of arguments once familiar in the councils of emperors. In the end, as a result of uneasy discussion, Theodore and another were dispatched to spy out the new menace, to get as near as they might to the wall, ascertain its strength and the method of its building, and with their return from a night expedition, there was more consultation and a hurried planning of defenses. Before winter was over, the haphazard settlement was a compound, a walled town in embryo, within the narrow limits of a circle, small enough for a handful of men to defend. All huts were crowded, all provisions stored, all animals driven at sunset, so that, in case of night attack, no man could be cut off and the strength of the tribe be at hand to resist the assailants. With waste, healthy miles stretching out on either side, the village itself was an evil-smelling huddle of cabins, since a short stretch of wall was easier to defend than long. Men and beasts were crowded together in a foulness that made for security. In times of feud, and times of feud were seldom distant, stones were heaped beside the barrier, in readiness to serve as missiles, Watch and ward was kept turn and turn by the able-bodied, and naturally, inevitably, and almost unconsciously, there was evolved a system of military discipline, of penalty for mutiny and cowardice. As in every social system from the beginning of time, the community was welded to a conscious whole, not by the love its members bore to each other, but by hatred and fear of the outsider. It was the enemy, the urgent common need to be saved from him, that made of man a comrade and a citizen. The peril from outside was the natural antidote to everyday hatreds and the ceaseless bickerings of close neighbors. The instinctive politics of a squalid village were in miniature the policy of vanished nations, and untraditioned little headmen, like dead and gone kings, quelled internal feuds by diverting attention to the danger that threatened from abroad. The foundations of community life in the new world like the foundations of community life in the old, were laid in the selfishness of fear. But for all its base origin, the life of the community imposed upon its members the essential virtues of the soldier and citizen, a measure of discipline and sacrifice. From these, in time, would grow loyalty and pride in sacrifice. The enclosure of ramshackle huts and pens was breaking its savages to achievements undreamed of and virtues as yet beyond their ken. The blind, stubborn instincts that created Babylon, created London and Rome and destroyed them, were laying well and truly in a mud-walled compound the foundations of cities which should rise, flourish, perish in the stead of London and of Rome. Outside the little fortress, with its noisome huddle of sheds and shelters, lay a belt of plowed land, of patches scraped and sown, where the women worked by the side of their men and worked alone when their men were gone hunting or fishing. One or two members of the tribe who were countrymen born were its saviors in its first years of leanness, imparting their knowledge of soil and seed to their unskilled comrades bred in towns. And by slow degrees, as the lesson was learned, the belt of tilled ground grew wider and more fertile, the little community more prosperous. As families grew and the tribes settled down, the makeshift shelters of wood and moss were succeeded by stronger and better built cabins. By the time that her second child was born, Ada was established in a weatherproof hut, a mud-walled building 
roofed with dried grass and with a floor of earth beaten hard. In its early years, it possessed a glazed window, a pane which Theodore had found whole in a crumbling house and set immovably in an aperture cut in his wall. But as years went on, unbroken glass was hard to come by, and there came a day when the window aperture, no longer glazed, was plastered up to keep out the weather. Long before he set about the building of his cabin, Theodore had brought a strip of ground under cultivation, sown a patch of potatoes and straggling beans, which in time expanded to a field. His life henceforth was largely the anxious life of the seasons, the sowing and tending and reaping of his crop, the struggle with the soil and the barrenness thereof, the ceaseless war against vermin. He ended rich as the men of his time counted riches, the possessor of goats, the owner of land which other men envied him, the father of sons who could till it. The new world gave him what it had to give, and gradually, with the passing of years, the hope of life civilized died in him, and he ceased to strain his eyes at the distance. It was slowly, very slowly, that hope died in him, but there came a day when, searching the skyline as his habit was, it dawned on his mind that he saw it automatically. It was habit only that made him lift his eyes to the horizon. He expected nothing when he shaded his eyes and looked this way and that. His belief in a world that was lettered and civilized had vanished. If that world yet existed, remote and apart, of a surety it was not for him, who perhaps was no longer capable of existence lettered and civilized. And if he himself could be broken to its decencies, what place had his children, his young barbarians, in an ordered atmosphere like that of his impossible youth? They belonged to their world, to its squalor, its dirt, its rude ignorance, as it might be, he also belonged. At the thought, he knelt and stared into the water, taking stock of the image it reflected and coming face to face with himself. His body and habits had adapted themselves to their surroundings his mind to the outlook of his world, to his daily, yearly struggle with the soil and vermin and his fellows. His relations with his fellows, with women, with himself, were not those of humanity civilized. It was nothing to him to go foul and unwashed or to clench his fist against his wife. Could he live the life he had been born and bred to of cleanliness, self-control, and courtesy? Or had he been stripped of the decencies which go to make civilized man? He covered his face with his broken nailed fingers and strove with God and his own soul that he might not fall utterly to ruin with his world, that some remnant might remain of his heritage. From the day when he saw himself for what he was and resigned all hope of the world of his youth, it seemed to him that he lived two divergent lives, one absorbed perforce in his digging and snaring, in the daily struggle for the daily wants of his household the other in his hours of summer rest in the long, dark winter evenings, an inward life of brooding that concerned itself only with the past. His memories became to him a species of cult, a secret ceremonial and a rite. That which had been, so he fancied, was not altogether waste, not altogether dead, so long as one man thought of it with reverence. When the mood took him, he would sit for long hours with his chin on his hand, staring at the fire while the children wondered at his silence, and Ada, wearied of talking to deaf ears, flung off to gossip with the neighbors. She, before she was thirty, was a haggard slattern of a woman, pitiable by reason of her discontent, and looking far older than her years. Childbearing aged her, and the fieldwork she hated, the bent-back drudgery she tried in vain to shirk and to which she brought no shred of understanding, even more she was aged by the weary desire that sulked in the corners of her mouth. Before she lost her comeliness, she had more than once sought distraction from her dullness and clumsy flirtation, which perhaps was no more than silly ogling and nudging and perhaps led to actual unfaithfulness. Theodore, not greatly interested in his wife's doings, ignored the danger to his household peace until it was forcibly thrust upon his notice by a jealous spitfire who cursed Ada for running after other women's husbands, and proceeded to tear out her hair. Ada's snuffling protestations, when the spitfire was pulled off, did not savor of injured innocence. 
he judged her guilty, at least in thought, cuffed her soundly, and from that time kept his eye on her. He was not, as she liked to think, jealous, salving her bruises with the comforting balm that two males were disputing the possession of her body. What stirred him to wrath fundamentally was his outraged sense of property in Ada, his woman, and the possibility that her lightness might entail on him the labor of supporting another man's child. The intrigue, if intrigue it were, ended on the day of the cuffing and the hair pulling. Her Lothario, awed by his spitfire or unwilling to tackle an outraged husband, avoided her company from that day forth, and Ada sank back to domesticity. She too, in the end, accepted the loss of the world that had made her what she was, ceased to search the horizon and strain her eyes for the deliverer, whereupon, having nothing to aim at or hope for, she lapsed into slovenly neglect of her home, alternating hours of clack and gossip with fits of sullen complaining at the daily misery of existence. Had destiny realized the dreams of her youth and set her to live out her married life in a shoddy little villa with bamboo furniture, she might have made a tolerable mother. She would at least have taken pride in the looks of her children, have dressed them with interest as she dressed herself, and tied up their hair with satin bows. Being what she was, she could take no pride in ragamuffins who ran half the year naked. She could see no beauty, even, in straight, agile limbs which were meant to be encased in reach-me-down suits or cheap costumes of cotton velveteen. Thus, her naked little ragamuffins, those of them that lived, were apt to be dirtier, less cared for, than the run of the dirty village youngsters. Theodore, in whom the instinct of fatherhood was strong, was sometimes roused to wrath by her stupid mishandling of her children, but on the whole he was patient with her, knowing it useless to be otherwise. He beat her as seldom as possible, and she was looked on by her neighbors as a woman kindly handled and unduly blessed in her husband. To the end, she remained what she had always been, essentially a parasite, a minor product of civilization, machine-bred and crowd-developed, bewildered by a life not lived in crowds and not subject to the laws of the machine. To the end, all nature was alien and hateful to her, raw life that she turned from with disgust. In her last illness, her mind, when it wandered, strayed back into the world where she belonged. Theodore, an hour before she died, heard her muttering of last bank holiday. She died at the end of a long, hard winter, during which she had failed and complained unceasingly, sat huddled to the fire and grown weaker, creeping at last to her straw in the corner and forgetting in delirium the meaningless life she had shared with her husband and children. Death smoothed out the lines in her sullen face. It was peaceful, almost comely, when Theodore looked his last on it and wondered, oddly, if among the many mansions were some cockney paradise of noise and jostle where his wife had found her heart's desire. Of the four or five children she had brought into the world, but two were living on the day of her death, her eldest born and a youngster at the crawling stage, but the care of even two children was a burdensome matter for a man unaided, and it was esteemed natural and no insult to the dead that Theodore should take another wife as speedily as might be, in the course not of months, but of weeks. He found a woman to suit his needs without going further than his own tribe, a woman left widowed a year or two before, who was glad enough to accept the offer of a better living than she could hope to make by her own scratching of a rod or two of earth and the uncertain charity of neighbors. The proposal of marriage made in stolid fashion was accepted as a matter of course, and that night, Theodore stared through the fire into a room in Westminster where a girl in a yellow dress made music and a young man listened from the corner of a sofa with a cigarette unlit between his fingers. He was dreaming at a table with silver and branching yellow roses when his son nudged him that supper was ready and he dipped his hand into a greasy bowl for the meat. The wedding followed swiftly on the heels of betrothal and was celebrated in the manner already compulsory and established by a public promise made solemnly before the headman, by a clasping of hands and a ceremony of religious blessing. This last was molded, like all tribal ceremonies, on remembered formulae and ritual, and the tradition that a wedding should be accompanied by much eating and general merrymaking 
was also faithfully observed. The new wife, if not overcomely or intelligent, was a sturdy young woman who had been broken to the duties required of her, and Theodore's home under its second mistress was better tended and more comfortable than in the days of her sluttish predecessor. He had married her simply as a matter of business, that she might help in his field work, cook his food, look after his children, and satisfy his animal desire. And on the whole, he had no reason to complain of the bargain he had made. She was a younger woman than Ada by some years, had been only a slip of a girl at the time of the ruin, and because of her youth, had adapted herself more readily than most of her elders to a world in the making and untraditioned methods of living. Her husband found life easier for the help of a pair of sturdy arms and pleasanter for lack of Ada's grumbling. She brought more than herself to Theodore's household, a child by her first husband, and as time went on, she bore him other children of his own. End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton. Chapter 23. As the years went by and his children grew to manhood in the world primitive, which was the only world they knew, the life of Theodore Savage became definitely twofold, a life of the body in the present and a life of the mind in the past. There was his outward rustic and daily self, the laborer, hunter, and fisherman, who begat sons and daughters, who trudged home at nightfall to eat and sleep heavily, who occasionally cudgeled his wife, a sweating, muscular animal man whose existence was bounded by his bodily needs and the bodily needs of his children, who fondled his children and cuffed them by turns as the beast cuffs and fondles its offspring, whose world was the world of a food patch enclosed in a valley, of a river where he fished, a wood where he snared, and a hut that received him at evening. In time, it was of these things, and these things only, that he spoke to his kin and his neighbors the weather, the luck of his hunting or fishing, the loves, births, and deaths of his fellows. With the rise and growth of a generation that knew only the world primitive, the little community lived more in the present and less in the past. Mention of the world that had vanished was even less frequent and even more furtive than before. And even if that had not been the case, there was no man in the tribe save Theodore, whose mind was the mind of a student. Thus his other life, his life of the past, was lived to himself alone. It was a vivid memory life in which he delved, turning over its vanished treasures, the intangible treasures of dead beauty, dead literature, learning, and art. A life that at times receded to a dream of the impossible, and at others was so real and overwhelming in its nearness that the everyday sweating and toiling and lusting grew vague and misty, was a veil drawn over reality. Sometimes the two lives clashed suddenly and oddly to the wonder of those who saw him, as on the day when his wife had burned the evening mess and raising his hand to chastise her carelessness, there flashed before his eyes without warning a vision of Phyllida bent delicately over her piano. Not only Phyllida, but the room, her surroundings, every detail clear to him and the loveliness of Chopin in his ears. Furniture, hangings, a Louis C's clock, and a Hogarth print, and swiftly seen objects whose very names he had forgotten. So long was it since he had made use of the household words that once described them. The dead world caught him back to itself and claimed him. In the face of its reality, the present faded. The burned stew mattered not, and his hand dropped slack to his side, while his wife's mouth, open for a wailing protest, hung open in gratified astonishment. He stared through the open door of the hut not seeing the tufted trees beyond it or the curving skyline of the hills. Then, taking mechanically his stout wooden spoon, he shoveled down his portion without tasting it. In his ears, like a song, was the varied speech of other days, of art, of daily mechanics, 
of books, of daily politics, of learning. Phyllida, her curved hands touching the keys, gave place to the eager, bespectacled face of a scholar who had tried to make clear to him the rhythm and beauty of French verse. He had forgotten the man's name, long forgotten it, but from some odd crevice in his brain, a voice came echoing down the years, caressing the lines as it quoted them. Oh, corsair, chavou plat, que de France était belle, a soleil de messador. His own lips framed the words involuntarily, attempting the accent long unheard. A soleil de messador, a soleil de messador. And his wife and children stared after him as, thrusting the happy and bowl aside, he rose and went out, muttering gibberish. They were not unused to these fits in the house father, to the change in his eyes, the sudden forgetting of their presence, but never lost their fear of them as something uncanny and inexplicable. With these masterful rushes of the past came often an infinite melancholy, which was not so much a regret for what had been as a sense of the pity of oblivion, so that he would lie outstretched with his face to the earth, rebellious at the thought that with him and a few of his own generation must pass all knowledge of human achievement, the very memory of that which had once been glorious, not only the memory of actual men whose fame had once been blown about the world, but the memory of sound, of music, and of marbles in stone, uplifted by the skill of generations, the memory of systems, customs, laws, wrought wisely by the hand of experience, and of fanciful people more real than living men and women. With him and his like would pass not only Leonardo, Caesar, and the sum of Mesidor, but Rosalind, D'Artagnan, and Faust, the heroes, the merrymen, the women loved and loving, who created of dreams, had shared the dead world with their fellows created of dust. Once deemed immortal, they had been slain by science as surely as their fellows of dust. At times he pondered vaguely whether he might not save the memory of some of them alive by teaching his children to love them. But in the end, he realized that, as we grasp nothing save through ourselves and our own relation to it, the embodied desires and beauty of an inconceivable age would be meaningless to his young barbarians. If he ceased to believe in the survival of life as he had known it and a civilization that would reach out and claim him, there were times when he believed, or almost believed, that somewhere in the vastness of the great round world, a remnant must hold fast to its inheritance, when it was inconceivable that all men living could be sunk in brutishness or vowed to the creed of utter ignorance. Hunger and blind terror, he knew, for he had seen it, could reduce the highest to the level of the beast. But with the passing of terror and the satisfaction of the actual needs of the body, there awakens the hunger of the mind, Somewhere in the vastness of the great round world must be those who, because they craved for more than full stomachs and daily security, still clung to the power which is knowledge. Little groups and companies that chance had brought together or good fortune saved from destruction. Resourceful men who had striven with surrounding anarchy and worsted it, and having worsted it, were building their civilization. And in the very completeness of surrounding anarchy, the very depth of surrounding brutishness, would lie their opportunity and chance of supremacy, their power of enforcing their will. If such groups, such future nations existed, he asked himself, how would they build? What manner of world would they strive for, knowing what they knew? This, at least, was certain. It would not be the world of their fathers, of their own youth. They had seen their civilization laid waste by the agency of science combined with human passion. Hence, if they rejected the alternative of ignorance and held to their perilous treasure of science, their problem was the mastery of passion. He came to believe that the problem, like all others, had been faced in forgotten generations, that old centuries had learned the forgotten lesson that the ruin was teaching anew. To a race that had realized the peril of knowledge, there would be two alternatives only, renunciation, the creed of blind ignorance and savagery, or the guarding of science as a secret treasure removed from all contact with the flame that is human emotion. There had been elder and long past civilizations in which knowledge was a mystery, the possession and the privilege of a caste. Tradition had come down to us of ancient wisdom, which might only be revealed to the initiate. 
A blind fear massacred scientific men. A wiser fear exalted them and set them apart as initiates. When science and human emotion between them had wrought the extreme of destruction and agony, there passed the reckless and idealistic dream of a world where all might be enlightened. The aim and tradition of a social system arising out of ruin would be the setting of an iron barrier between science and human emotion. That, and not enlightenment of all and sundry, the admission of the foolish, the impulsive, and the selfish to a share in the power of destruction. The same need and instinct of self-preservation which had inspired the taking of the vow of ignorance would work in higher and saner minds for the training of a caste, an Egyptian priesthood, exempt from blind passion and the common impulse of the herd. A caste trained in silence and rigid self-control, its way of attainment made hard to the student, the initiate. The deadly formula of mechanics, electricity, and chemistry would be entrusted only to those who had been purged of the daily common passions of the multitude, to those who, by trial after trial, had fettered their natural impulses and stripped themselves of instinct and desire. So, in times past, had arisen, and might again arise, a scientific priesthood whose initiates to the vulgar were magicians, a caste that guarded science as a mystery and confined the knowledge which is power of destruction to those who had been trained not to use it. The old lost learning of dead and gone kingdoms was a science shielded by its devotees from defilement by human emotion, a pure, cold knowledge set apart and worshipped for itself. And somewhere in the vastness of the great round world, the beginnings of a priesthood, a scientific caste, might be building unconsciously on the lines of ancient wisdom and laying the foundations of yet another Egypt or Chaldea, a state whose growth would be noted in the mystery of knowledge and fear of human passion, whose culture and civilization would be molded by a living and terrible tradition of catastrophe through science uncontrolled. And so long as the tradition was living and terrible, the initiate would stand guard before his mysteries that the world might be saved from itself. Only when humanity had forgotten its downfall and ruin had ceased to be even a legend would the barrier between science and emotion be withdrawn and knowledge be claimed as the right of the uncontrolled, the multitude. Till his brain began to fail him, he watched in dumb interest the life and development of the tribe, learning from it more than he had ever known in the world of his youth of the eternal foundations on which life and community is built. The unending struggle between the desire for freedom, which makes of man a rebel, and the need for security, which makes of him a citizen, was played before his understanding eyes. He watched parties, castes, and priesthoods in the making, and before he died, could forecast the beginning of an aristocracy, a slave class, and a tribal hereditary monarchy. In all things, man untraditional held blindly to the ways he had forgotten. Instinctively, not knowing whither they led, he trod the paths that his fathers had trodden before him. Most of all, he was stirred in his interest and pity by the life religious of the world around him, watching it adapt itself steadily and naturally to the needs of a race in its childhood. As a new generation grew up to its heritage of ignorance, the foundations of faith were shifted. As tribal life crystallized, gods multiplied inevitably, and the heaven ruled by a supreme being gave place to a crude Valhalla of minor deities. Man who makes God in his own image can only make that image in the likeness of his own highest type, which, in a world divided, insecure, and predatory, is the type of the successful warrior. The savior, in a world divided and predatory, takes the form of a tribal deity who secures to his people the enjoyment of their fields by strengthening their hands against the assaults and the malice of their enemies. As always, with those who live in constant fear and in hate of one another, the Lord was a man of war. And when Theodore's first grandson was received into the tribe, the deity to whom vows were made in the name of the child was already a local Jehovah. Faith saw him as a tribal Lord of hosts, the celestial captain of his worshipers. If his worshippers walked humbly and paid due honor to his name, he would stand before them in the day of battle and protect them with his shield invisible, would draw the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, show himself mightier than the priests of Baal, 
and overthrow the altars of Philistines. A God whose attributes are those of a warrior of necessity is not omnipotent. Since he fights, his authority is partial, assailed and disputed by those against whom he draws the sword. A race in its childhood evolved the deity it needed, a champion and upholder of his own people. To the tribal warrior, the God to whom an enemy prayed for success was a rival of his own protector. So the mind primitive argued, more or less directly and consciously, making God in its image for its own needs and purposes. And even in Theodore's lifetime, the deities worshiped by men from a distance were not those of his own country. The jurisdiction of the gods was limited and the stranger of necessity paid homage to an alien spirit who took pleasure in an unfamiliar ritual. In his lifetime, the darkness of heaven was unbroken and there emerged no God whose attribute was mercy and long suffering. The day of judgment was still too recent, its memory too clear and overwhelming to admit of the idea of a divine love or a father who had pity on his children. Fear and fear only led his people to the feet of the Lord, the God of vengeance of the first generation and the tribal superman who gradually ousted him from his pride of place were alike wrathful, jealous of their despotism, and greedily expectant of mouth honor. Hence, propitiation and ignorance were the whole religious duty of man, and the rites wherewith deity was duly worshipped were rites of crawling flattery and sacrifice. The blood of sinners was acceptable in the sight of heaven. The Lord Almighty had destroyed a world that he might slake his vengeance, and his lineal descendants, the celestial warriors, rejoiced in the slaughter of those who had borne arms against their worshippers. In the end, rejoiced in blood for itself and the savior of the burnt sacrifice. And a race cowed spiritually, lest worse befall it, evolved its rites of sacrificial cruelty, paying tribute to a God who took ceaseless pleasure in the humbling of his people and could only be appeased by their suffering. There were seasons and regions where abasement produced its own reaction, when, for all the savor of sacrificial cruelty, the gods remained deaf to the prayers of their worshipers, delivered them into the hands of their enemies, or chastened them with famine and pestilence. Hope of salvation beaten out of them, the worshipers, like rats driven into a corner, ceased to grovel and turned on the tyrants who had failed them. And the Lord Almighty, who made the heavens, shrunk to the dimensions of a local fetish, was upbraided and beaten in effigy. Since it seemed that the new world must in all things follow in the ways of the old, the gentler deities who delighted not in blood would in due time reveal themselves to man grown capable of mercy. As the memory of judgment faded with the centuries, as the earth waxed fruitful and life was kindlier, humanity would dare to lift its head from the dust and the life religious would be more than blind cringing to a despot. The heaven of the future would find room for gods who were gracious and friendly, for white baldurs and Olympians who walk with men and instruct them. And there would arise prophets whose message was not vengeance, but a call to rejoice in the Lord. And in further time, it might be the God who is a spirit and a Christ, the rise, the long, slow upward struggle of the soul of man was as destined and inevitable as its fall. All human achievement, material or spiritual, was founded in the baseness of mire and clay and rose towering above its foundations. As the state, which had its origins in no more than common fear and hatred, in the end would be honored without thought of gain and its flag held sacred by its sons. So deity, beginning as vengeance personified, would advance to a spiritual law and a spiritual love. When the power of loving returned to the race, it would cease to abase itself and lift up its eyes to a father, endowing its deity with that which was best in itself. When it achieved and took pleasure in its own thoughts and the works of its hands, it would see in the highest not the vengeance that destroys, but the spirit that heals and creates. Meanwhile, the foundation of life religious was and must be the timorous virtue of ignorance of humble avoidance of inquiry into the dreadful secrets of God. In Theodore's youth, he had turned from the orthodox religions, which repelled by what seemed to him a fear of knowledge and inquiry. Now he understood that man, being by nature destructive, can survive only when his powers of destruction are limited, and that the ignorance enjoined by priest and bigot 
had been and would be again an essential need of the race, an expression of the will to live. The jealous God who guards his secrets is the God of the race that survives. How many times, he would wonder, how many times since the world began to spin has man, in his eager search for truth, rushed blindly through knowledge to the ruin that means chaos and savagery? How many times in his devout, instinctive longing to know his own nature and the workings of the infinite mind that created him, has he wrought himself weapons that turned to his own destruction? Ignorance of the powers and forces of nature is a condition of human existence, as necessary to the continued life of the race as the breathing of air or the taking of food into the body. Behind the bench of zealots who judged Galileo lay the dumb race memory of ruin, ruin perhaps many times repeated. They stood, the zealots, for that ignorance which, being interpreted, is life, and Galileo for that knowledge which, being interpreted, is death. Many times it might be, since the world began to spin, had men called upon the rocks to cover them from the devils their own hands had fashioned. Many times it might be, a remnant had put from it the knowledge it dared not trust itself to wield, that it might not fall upon its own weapons, but live, just live, like the beasts. Behind the injunction to devout ignorance, behind the ecclesiastical hatred of science and distrust of brain, lay more than prejudice and bigotry. The prejudice and bigotry were but superficial and outward workings of instinct, and the first law of all, the law of self-preservation. With his eyes open to the workings of that law, folktale and myth had long become real to him, since he saw them daily in the making. The dragon that wasted a country with its breath, how else should a race that knew naught of chemistry account for the delivery of gas? And he understood now why the legend of Icarus was a legend of disaster, and Prometheus, who stole fire from heaven, was chained to eternity for his daring. He knew also why the angel with a flaming sword barred the gate of Eden to those who had tasted of knowledge. The story of the garden, of the fall of man, was no more the legend of his youth. He read it now with his opened eyes as a livid and absolute fact, a fact told plainly as symbol could tell it by a race that had put from it all memory of the science whereby it was driven from its ancient paradise, its garden of civilization. How many times since the world began to spin had man mastered the knowledge that should make him like unto God and turned in agony of mind and body from a power synonymous with death? And how many times more, he wondered, how many times more? Theodore Savage lived to be a very old man. How old in years he could not have said, since long before his memory failed him, he had lost his count of time. But for fully a decade before he died, he went humped and rheumatic, leaning on a stick, was blear-eyed, toothless, and wizened. He had outlived all those who had begun the new world with him, and a son of his grandson was of those who, when the time came, dug a trench for his bones and shoveled loose earth on his head. He had no lack of care in his extreme old age, in part because the tribe grew to hold him in awe that increased with the years the sole survivor of the legendary age that preceded the ruin and downfall of man. He was feared in spite of his helplessness. He alone of his little community could remember the ruin with any comprehension of its causes. He alone possessed in silence a share of that hidden and forbidden knowledge which had brought flaming judgment on the world. Here and there in the countryside were gray-headed men, his juniors by years, who could remember vaguely the horrors of a distant childhood the sky afire, the crash of falling masonry, the panic, the lurking and the starving. These things they could remember like a nightmare past, but only remember, not explain. Behind Theodore's bald forehead and dimmed, oozing eyes lay the understanding of why and wherefore denied to those who dwelt beside him. For this reason, Theodore Savage was treated with deference in the days of his senile helplessness. As he sat half blind, in the sun by the door of his hut, no one ever failed to greet him with respect in passing. While in most the greeting was more than a token of respect or kindliness, the sign and result of a nervous desire to propitiate. In the end, he was credited with a knowledge of unholy arts, and the children of the tribe avoided and shrank from him, frightened by the gossip of their elders, so that village mothers found him useful as a bogey, arresting the tantrums of unruly brats 
by threats of calling an old bald head. Even in his lifetime, legends clustered thick about him, and sickness or accident to man or beast was ascribed to the glance of his pure blind eye or the malice of his vacant brain. While there was once, though he never knew or suspected it, an agitated and furtive discussion as to whether, for the good of the community, he should not be knocked on the head. The furtive discussion ended in discussion only, not because the advocates of mercy were numerous, but because no man was willing to lay violent hands on a wizard for fear of what might befall him. And the interlude over, the tribe relapsed into its customary timid respect for its patriarch, its customary practice of ensuring his goodwill by politeness and small offerings of victuals. These added to the old man's comfort in his latter years, nor had he any suspicion of the motive that secured him both deference and dainties. With his death, the local legends increased and multiplied, the distorted, varied myths of the ruin of man and its causes showing an inevitable tendency to group themselves around one striking and mysterious figure, to make of that figure a cause and a personification of the great disaster. Theodore Savage, to those who came after, was Merlin, Frankenstein, and Adam, the fool who tasted of forbidden fruit, the magician whose arts had brought ruin on a world, the devil artisan whose unholy skill had created monsters that destroyed him. His grave was an awesome spot, apart from other graves, which the timorous avoided after dark. And long after all trace of it had vanished, there clung to the neighborhood a tradition of haunting and mystery. To his children's children, his name was a symbol of a dead civilization. A civilization that had passed so completely from the ken of living man that its lost achievements, the manner of its endings, could only be expressed in symbol. End of chapter 23. Recording by Jennifer Mazzacci. End of Theodore Savage, A Story of the Past or the Future by Cicely Hamilton.